Hello and welcome to the Cardiac Cats YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jacob Shorba, and it is time to talk about the second day of the 2024 NFL Draft. Just wrapped up, had the 100th pick in probably about 10 minutes ago, so I've been getting everything together to be able to talk to you guys about the players that Jacksonville selected, um, just some of my thinking through it, my thoughts, and uh, talk about maybe some of the players that are also available on day three, because I'll tell you one thing, there are a lot of talented players that are going to be options for Jacksonville to pick. So definitely be excited for tomorrow as far as the opportunities. We'll see what Jacksonville does with it. Um, they're very much a team that's hard to predict, right? But we'll, we'll see what happens. So it'll kick off at uh, 12 Eastern tomorrow, which is really nice. It'll be a long day of it, but uh, we'll get some finality on this. But we're going to talk about two selections today one being at 48 the other at 96 no trades for the jacksonville jaguars they started by taking defensive tackle mason smith out of lsu now my initial reaction honestly was very disappointed with this pick and the reason why is because well mason smith has the ceiling to live up to the selection there I just thought, for one, he's not close to being the best player even at the position. I had Chris Jenkins as a fringe first-rounder, early second-round pick. Uh, Chris Jenkins Jr., that is. And I, I just think that there's a lot of risk involved with this pick when you have a class that has a lot of very like trustworthy players. When we're talking about projections, like there are guys on the board that even at this point, like I still trust to be productive pros at the next level. It is a very good draft class. And so my thoughts, and I, I think I've said this before on the channel. If I have not, you'll hear it for the first time. With the draft class this good, you don't want to put yourself in a spot, and you have no excuse to be in a spot where you're taking extremely risky picks. And there is a lot of risk in Mason Smith. But I do want to also, like, I'm going to say some good things, right? Because this is not an all bad thing. And my initial reaction, it's a bit too harsh compared to what it should have been. If there is any situation, and this goes the same for Brian Thomas Jr., which he's he's a very different kind of player, obviously, but kind of feel the same way. If you look at the 32 teams in the NFL and who is going to be the best fit for these guys, like you're talking about Mason Smith specifically, this is the best spot he could have gone to. He reunites with a former teammate in Brian Thomas Jr. He comes back to work with Ryan Nielsen. I know there's other coaches and members of this team that he's going to reunite with that know his history throughout college. And what I am convinced of, and this is what I feel like helps to justify the pick, um, even though it's not what I would have done, of course. They saw firsthand why he never broke out in college. And so I think they understand that they feel like they have a good situation and they feel like they got a shot maybe to have a player that in a couple years when you're going to need him to start is going to be a monster. I, I think they're hoping for that and maybe they'll be right. Maybe they'll be wrong. We'll see at the end of the day. I know I'll be rooting for Mason Smith. I, I loved his interview when he was drafted and, um, as far as the character stuff, I'll be I'll be completely honest right now, guys. I actually thought off the limited amount I heard from him that character might have been an issue because 2022, I, I believe it was that year, he tore, it might have been his ACL, celebrating. And it just turned me off of him, like the second I watched him. And I think that's part of the reason why he's so low on my board. And there are players who I feel like did not get due justice. Mason Smith is probably one of those. And listening to him, I feel very different about him as a person and what he's going to be as a player. I think this is a good situation for him. I think he's he's right when he says that he was overjoyous when he saw it was Jacksonville calling on the phone because this is the best team for him to go to and develop. We've got defensive linemen here. He can play behind. He, he has time. He's still a young guy. He's got tons of tools. He's working with Ryan Nielsen. It's a great situation for him. Now, of course, like saying that, I obviously wish we went a different direction. And I think there were some other opportunities there. The one, 
that I kind of pushed at the start of the second round, what I was saying was you had, I think it was four guys that you could have potentially moved up for. And so one of them was Kool-Aid McKinstry. Another was Jackson Powers Johnson. The top of the list was Johnny Newton. And I believe the fourth was Ennis Rakestraw Jr., who did end up falling much further than 48. So if they wanted him and they moved up for him, they obviously wouldn't have been necessary. But there were players that I had ranked as potential first-round prospects. And if I was Jacksonville, like my thought process would have been, I'm going to wait until one of those guys is left. I would have assumed they would have had them high on their board. And then I'm going to move up when there's one guy left, make the trade, you know, give up the least I have to doing that, of course, and just take a guy that that's going to be good. And so who was that? That was actually Jackson Powers Johnson, who ended up going, I believe, 44th to the Las Vegas Raiders. I think they would have had a trade opportunity with the Arizona Cardinals at 43. Now, you could try to say, oh, well, maybe Arizona didn't think Max Melton would make it past there. I, I You don't know that for a fact, right? And the Cardinals trade a lot. They take opportunities um, like that. And maybe they could have done that. At the end of the day, I I can nitpick the process. I can throw out all these things. But I understand why they made the pick. I get it. But it's also a pick that has the potential to lead to a very disappointing outcome in a draft class that should have very reliable prospects in it that you should be picking. That's my main issue. When I'm rooting for him, I hope the best for Mason Smith. I understand why they were enticed with him. It makes sense. It all adds up. I just don't think it adds up to the 48th overall pick. Now, saying that, kind of my last note on it, he was probably going to go somewhere shortly after this pick because other teams probably felt the same way. There was talk about Mason Smith probably being like a late second, early third kind of guy because teams are going to look at that and naturally say, what if I could do better than the coaching staff he was with before and make him into a great football player because he has all the potential to be that. And what better team to think that than Jacksonville, given the situation? So, like, what do I grade it? Um, I'm just going to be honest, guys. It's very similar to the Brian Thomas Jr. grade in the sense that the outcomes are very wide. And I know I'm copping out of it a little bit. I said actually earlier on Twitter, I would have given this an F if they did it. I don't agree with that now. Like given some of the thinking and given that I have him probably a lot lower than he should be, I would probably lay this around a D because I do think that there were much better opportunities that they should have taken advantage of And like my philosophy, as far as the draft, you know, you obviously want to try to get a blue chip prospect first round, but you ideally want to be in a spot. Maybe you move back, you take a guy who's falling like this year. I think that was Johnny Newton would be an example. They did it with Brian Thomas Jr. That's a great other way to do it, but use those extra picks or something you got to move up in the second and go get another one of those first round players. That's what I wish they did. It's okay at the end of the day. You know, we'll we'll see what happens. And time is the only thing that's going to tell. Because I can sit here and tell you what I think is going to happen. It's not what I know, right? He's got to take the field and play. So that's my thought on uh, the Mason Smith pick. I have him at 120. Probably deserves to be higher. Now, on Jerry and Jones, um, I'm going to be kind of limited on what I say with him. Because he was not a player I felt like I had a fully complete scouting profile on. This is my first year trying to do the entire process. I started at the beginning of the college football season, even with 154 players on here. And given that there were more at points when guys were not eliminated yet, it was hard to get all these profiles done to a point that I was confident in. And Jerry on Jones, who is actually down at 140 on here is one of those guys. And I'll I'll give this to kind of hint or, or push on what I'm saying. Bernardo Green was ranked very similar to him when I originally scouted him. But when I went back and watched him, I just missed stuff on film. And so I think it's very much the same with Jerry on Jones. 
to me, like in the things I did see, he is a smart football player and he does have great athleticism. You can see it here. There's stuff that he has to, he has to work with, but he also has some limitations. He has 30 inch arms. He's a small wingspan, much smaller than most of the cornerbacks, really small hands. I'm not as concerned with all those things, but they are concerns at least to some extent. And, you know, sometimes like the reaction speed wasn't great. You can kind of see that even like where the 10 yard split, you look at Johnny Wilson who ran a, what a 10th and a half slower and their 10 yard splits almost identical. I don't think Jerry on Jones has great explosion from what I saw. It, it's ample, but it kind of hurt him keeping up on routes. But the good thing, like the things that make sense about Jerry on Jones He's coming from a team that ran a lot of man coverage. That's great. That's going to fit in Jacksonville. Makes a lot of sense why they won one of those cornerbacks. They got one in Jerry on Jones. He played in the slot this last year, which we can look at here. Snap counts. And you, you can see this if you watch the live stream that I just had before this. In 2023, he played 394 snaps in the slot. He actually played more snaps in kick coverage than he did outside. So not a lot of experience this last year in wide, but in 2022, it's the opposite. He actually played about the same amount out wide and then, you know, slot, he played less than he did in kick coverage. So he has versatility. He's played all over. It's just been a year since he played outside. So could they say like, Hey, let's have you be an outside corner. They could, I I think he should probably be the backup to start and they can feel comfortable with what they have here. Um, of course, we got to see how he plays. But I will note, you look at his grades in 2022, playing outside compared to 2023, significantly worse. He was a better player when he moved into the slot, given that he's also a college football player. He's getting better every year, and that's also got to be a factor. So it makes sense. Like It's a fit, and I, I can see why they value him. And I think it's a fine pick. It's just at the end of the day, and I'll I'll say the grade on this, I'll give it right now a C. We'll go with that. I think think it's an average pick. I don't have big problems with it. It's just when when you have your, your big board together and they're consistently going really far down, you just start to ask, like, are they reaching for needs? Are we reaching or are we reaching for players that we really, really want, even if they're not the best options on the board. Those are the questions I have to start asking because for example, look at who's available right now. we we'll kind of transition into that. Javon Baker is sitting here on the board. Still TJ Tampa was there. Troy Franklin, Devontae Walker is still sitting out there. You've got, if you want a backup quarterback, you got your pick of the litter pretty much. You've got even other cornerbacks here. I, I could go down this list. And sure, like a lot of it's cornerback and wide receiver. And they got the cornerback they prefer. I just feel like there were better players on the board. And I I get a little concerned. Maybe they're just like they like certain people and they're just going to make sure they get them. Especially when we heard today, hours before the draft, that Mason Smith was probably going to be the pick. Because there was a report on that. And all of a sudden, he's the pick. And I thought he probably would be based off that until, you know, I tried to convince myself he wasn't going to be because I, I didn't want him to be the pick before he was. But it just feels like maybe sometimes they, they sort of make their plans before and they don't let the board fall to them necessarily. Who knows if I'm right? Just just a little bit of speculation. But talking about um, day three, some of the opportunities there, to me, like, I would be okay if they just did something like they did last year and at least, like, hit on one of those guys and have a couple more that might be okay. Just try to get one of these falling players. You can see, like, picks they have left. They've got 114, 116, 153, 167, 212, 236. I don't know if I'd say they have room on the roster for all these guys. I think maybe if they use later picks, like one of them, say, on a kicker, then you can justify it because you're taking someone off the roster who's currently there. 
But looking at like how many names I've got here, and it's hard to look at what names are going to be removed off this list. As far as how many you have on the roster, like there's 53 players that are rostered. I have 54 listed here right now. This is with six more picks. This gets you up to 60 players. And who are you moving on from? Like, that's the question. You know, you're not cutting Parker Washington. You'd probably cut Chris Braswell, Christian Braswell. I think Ventral Miller has to stay. You tried trading up for him. Monteric Brown should probably be on the team. But you just keep going through this and it's like, okay, maybe DeGuara. I don't think that it's ideal for Jacksonville to have this many picks in the draft given how many players they already have filling out the roster. You got to take opportunities sometime to move up. You know, another example of one, Christian Haynes in the third round. We hadn't moved up yet. We had extra picks. You get a guy falling who is a perfect fit for your scheme. He can play right guard. He's played there a ton. You can have him as the backup on the interior this year, solidify your depth, and start him next year. And you got your long-term solution. Like, there's things out there like that. I just, I wish it happened. I get why it doesn't, right? Like, for us to sit here and predict the picks is incredibly difficult. And when we want someone, it's very rare it happens. In my lifetime, I have had one player I've ever really, really wanted, like, talking about early in the draft, that we actually picked. Other than, obviously, Trevor Lawrence. And that ended up being Devin Lloyd. And it was very lucky that that happened because he had a fall and the Jaguars had to trade up for him. It's just not common. So I get things go differently. I just think that they could have done a little bit better of a job getting value. It's always going to be that way. At the end of the day, like it's similar to last year. Day one, phenomenal job. I, I can maybe sit there and say, I'll give Brian Thomas Jr. a C because he could be anything, but I probably should bump that up because he's a perfect fit for this team. It's where he should go. It's the range he should be in. Like, it was a very good pick, and they got extra capital. It's one of the better picks of the first round, but then you get to the day, and you get picks that they're more questionable. You know, fans are fighting on Twitter over them because it's not clear that they should have been the guy. You know, there's people who have him, like me, past 100. And so I hope it works out for them all. I really do. Like, I have nothing against these guys. I want to see them succeed. We just got to gotta see how things go at the next level. And uh, I, I really, I don't know right now. I think they're both backups. I don't think you got impact starters right now. That is also a major problem because that's what you want to do with these picks. That is the goal on day two. You have to set the bar high. Mason Smith could be that down the road. I don't know about Jerry on Jones. I think he's probably someone who ends up being at best like an average starter. I hope I eat my words, but it's just what I've seen. So I'm kind of starting to ramble a little bit, honestly. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I appreciate you guys watching the two streams today. No streams are going to be out tomorrow. It's day three. Um, I remember like last year I tried streaming for picks and it was great when we got Antonio Johnson. That worked perfectly. And maybe if we steal someone, I'll do a stream. But that's probably it. Because we got random picks. I'm just like, who the heck is this guy? So it wasn't really offering much to y'all. But I appreciate everyone who joined today. Everyone who's watched this channel over the off season. It's been a blast. Um, been really successful for us. And um, I, I couldn't do this. And I wouldn't do this without you guys supporting it. So thank you for what you do. Hope you guys enjoy the last day of the NFL draft. I'll give, keep giving you content. We'll have a lot to talk about even after the draft. So thanks. Have a great night and go Jags.